Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next VELP Scientifica webinar series installment. Today, we're going to be going over how to optimize Duma analyses for different types of food samples. So today, I want to go over a little bit of an agenda and the topics we're going to discuss. We're going to first start with an introduction to elemental analysis and go over some of the basics in that. We'll then go over the Duma method, analytical overview, and some of the specifics pertaining to that. We'll go over some features and benefits of our VELP NDA series Duma nitrogen analyzers. We'll study different types of food samples and we'll look at some of the results with that. We'll then go over our analytical best practices and some of the sample treatment and sample preparation. And finally, we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. Um, today, the speakers will be myself. My name is Corey Letizio. I am the VELP National Sales Manager for North America and specifically for the United States. And we'll also be hearing from Dr. Ugo Bersolini. He's a former laboratory manager for a world leading Italian food company. As a reminder, you can type your questions at any time during the webinar um, in that chat box there on your right, and we will answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So to give you a little bit of a quick background on Velp Scientifica, the company was established in 1983 and is privately owned still by the company or by the family that started the um, that started the company. Our headquarters in manufacturing are located in Italy and specifically about 30 kilometers north of Milan. And Velp Scientific Inc. is a subsidiary that I am a part of. We are based out of Long Island, New York. We provide sales, service, and analytical support to the North American market. In addition to us, we also have Velp China Co. They were established in 2019 and they provide sales and service support to the greater China market. In addition to this, we also have representative offices in Argentina and in India. And this is where we work with over 300 authorized partners in over 100 countries to best serve our customers around. Now today, we're gonna to be focused specific on the elemental analyzers, the Duma analyzers, but I like to mention VELP's product portfolio goes for both analytical instrumentation as well as laboratory equipment. And as you can see on the laboratory equipment side, we work with things like magnetic stirs and hot plates, respirometers, um, pumps, things of that nature. But again, we'll be focusing today on the analytical instrumentation side and specifically our elemental analyzers for protein determination. Now, what I'd like to mention before we get started is the local service and application support that we have here in North America, as well as around the world. And this can take many shapes and forms, starting off with our help desk and remote support to support you guys whenever you need around the clock. Um, we also provide anal analytical support and specifically application support so you can best optimize your methods for whether it's EPA, AOAC, things of that nature. Now, when we get into the technical assistance side of the business, we'll be looking at more of installation and training on site, as well as preventative maintenance. And this is where a VELP service technician for your area can come on site, install the equipment, do preventative maintenance, and answer any questions on site that you guys may have. And finally, getting back to that more analytical side, we also have calibration certifications, so you're able to ensure that your instrument is running at its most optimal so now let's talk a little bit about the VELP elemental analyzers. And let's start off first with talking about elemental analysis. So to start, elemental analysis is the process to determine the quantity of a particular element within a mo molecule or material. Um, some examples of samples could be cheeses, meats, um, you know, waste waters, varying things across different, um, I guess, analytical methods as well as different industries. And within elemental analysis, it can be divided into two distinct groups. Qualitative, which is determining which elements are present um, in the actual sample, as well as quantitative. And this is what we see a little bit more of, and that is determining how much of a particular element is present in your sample. And as you can see on the right, the main, I guess, focus of today will be that organic analysis for elemental analysis, and that'll be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, as well as oxygen. And these are substances with carbon. So that's an important distinction versus inorganic. So elemental analysis 
is the uh, technique of choice for the quantitative determination by oxidation as well as pyrolysis of organic content for CH and SNO in samples, as I was mentioning previously. It helps determine the structure of an unknown compound as well as evaluate the structure and purity of a synthesized compound. And this enables overall to access a wealth of information from your sample, again, depending on your parameters and what you're looking to analyze. One thing about our elemental analyzers as overall, these are highly productive instruments. So this is able to give oftentimes labs with large sample volume, a large return on investment. And this can do with number of samples ran per day. We're looking at three to five minutes per sample. So high throughput, depending on how many samples you have. And there's also a variety of matrices. So the benefit of this versus a traditional Keldahl application is that you're actually going to be able to run many different types of samples all at once. And that kind of goes into the next point of that unattended work. Um, so you can allow for long walk away times. Now we'll talk about this a little bit later, but with our NDA series, we have an auto sampler that allows you to analyze 117 samples at once. So with this, it's gonna free up staff from some of those repetitive and low pro productivity tasks, and you can deliver the results on an automated basis once those samples are loaded. So let's talk briefly about the history of VELP elemental analyzers. We first started with our NDA 701, which was determination of protein specifically for nitrogen samples and just using helium. We then came out with our NDA702, which gave you the option to use either helium or argon as a dual carrier analyzer. We then came out with our carbon nitrogen analyzer, which is also a Dumas and a dual carrier um, elemental analyzer. And finally, most recently, we came out with our EMA502, and this allows for CHNSO elemental analysis. So let's go over the VELP MDA series in a little bit more depth. So to start off with, what's really important to know about this instrument is that it's the primary method and uses some of those worldwide body kind of accordances and specific methods for the actual um, sample and depending on different labs. Example of those include the AOAC, the AACC, ISO, EPA, and many others. And this is, like I mentioned, a primary method for the determination of nitrogen and protein in samples. So for those that aren't familiar, I want to briefly go over the Dumas combustion method and what is all included in order to get that final nitrogen result with a thermal conductivity detector. So to start off with, sample preparation is going to be key for any Dumas analysis. So as an example, what we usually look for is samples to be as homogenous as possible, and yet so you're going to get your most repeatable results. From your sample preparation, it then goes into our combustion chamber. And this is where the sample is rapidly combusted and turned into NOx, H2, H2O, CO2, things of that nature, along with that carrier gas, either being helium or argon. Now, during the reduction phase, it's going to go from NOx into N2. And that's going to be the critical part to actually get it into quantifiable nitrogen. Um, from there, you're going to have the separation of CO2 and H2O to get your nitrogen or N2 along with your carrier. And finally, it will move on to our TCD, our thermal conductivity detector. And that's where you're going to detect nitrogen and then can be factored out into protein. So I like showing this screen a little bit because it's going to show you a little bit more of the workflow and how our instrument specifically works and some of the differences in that. So as you can tell from the top of the, the picture to your left, you're going to see the actual auto sample. And it's going to push a sample, depending on what type of sample, again, could be different um, food, agricultural, chemical samples, things of that nature. It's going to push the sample into our combustion furnace. And this is where, like I mentioned, it's going to rapidly combust the sample and then take it down through our first water trap. Now, I like to talk a little bit about our first water trap because this is where about 99% of the water is actually trapped. And this is a maintenance-free physical trap with a Peltier fan in the back. And this is gonna be important to do this before our reduction furnace to save on consumables for our reduction furnace. And as you, I just mentioned on the right there, you can see our RF, our reduction furnace, 
And this is going to be where NOx turns into N2, like I mentioned. Um, and this is made up of finely ground copper and copper oxide. Now from there, it goes to what is known as our second water trap. And this is a chemical water trap and it uses anhydro. And the goal of this is to remove the last about 1%, oftentimes less, percent of water. And coming out of this should be just a carrier gas and then nitrogen as well as CO2. And that gets to my next point about our CO2 separation. And the objective of this is to remove the CO2 so that the only thing entering the TCD is that final nitrogen value. And this graphic is a little bit misleading because there's actually two CO2 traps. And the idea is, is that while one is running, the other one is regenerating. So that way you're able to simultaneously or continuously run samples with our auto sampler without having to stop and wait for regeneration. And then finally, this is the actual analytical side of it. And this is called our TCD, again, our thermal conductivity detector. And this is going to detect total nitrogen. And the only thing that will be going through there will be nitrogen and then the carrier gas, either helium or argon, depending on your choice. Now, what's good about this is it's a low gas TCD analyzer. And what this is, is a single flow gas line. So it does not use a separate reference gas line thus saving a lot in costs and overall consumable um, usage. And our limit of detections is going to be one of the main differences between our helium and argon, where you're looking at 0 0.001 milligrams of nitrogen with helium or 0 0.01 milligrams of nitrogen with argon. And this is just due to the higher thermal conductivity um, than with argon if you were to use helium. So like I mentioned, our standard configuration comes with one disk for 30 samples at a time for our auto sampler. But again, if you're looking for a higher throughput and more, um, I guess, less time in front of the instrument, you can add an addition of three disks for up to 117 samples total. And these can be added at any time after the purchase of the instrument. Um, and what's really nice is the auto sampler is actually pneumatic and uses compressed air. So you don't have to worry about any sort of electronic breakdowns or anything like that with the auto sample. And what I also like to mention is our Dumasaw. And this is the software that our instrument actually runs on. So what's beneficial is that all of your useful information is in one window. So weights, different types of samples, um, you know, all of those important data points you're gonna need are gonna be there. And from there, you can create, save and recall a database depending on whether it's Excel, CSV, text, whatever is your preference in the lab. You can customize these reports, again, for your preferences. And this is going to be where the creation and management of calibration curves is going to happen, which will be very good. And you have the possibility to use different nitrogen standards with this software. And with our VELP Ermes connectivity, you can be connected to the cloud as well as have remote support from our analytical team at any time with connecting to the cloud. So I'll go over quickly a little bit about the calibration and the nitrogen detection. So our TCD signal, our peak for our nitrogen is actually going to determine the area. And this is going to do so automatically and calculated with our software again, so there is no manual steps from, from there. From there, the calibration curve will be at play, and that's where usually about five to six standards of our EDTA um, are going to be at different weights and standards, and this is where it's actually going to measure to get that milligrams of nitrogen. And that calibration curve database is stored, so it's not something you have to work with all that often. So from that, finally, we have our milligrams, and that's where different results are calculated by the software automatically. It can be in percent nitrogen, milligrams of protein or percent protein. And you can also, from there, look at your standard deviation and relevant standard deviation. And this is calculated automatically, so there's no need for the user to do so. So what I like to mention as well about our instrument are genuine consumables. And this is in order, and you need to use these in order to get the most accurate and reliable results um, with your system. And these, each one of these have been designed and manufactured by Velp Scientific. Now, the analysis kit permits, um, you can also order up to 1,000 analyses at a time, 2,000 analyses, or 4,000. So you're able to have everything all at once and get a rough analysis um, with those actual kits. 
So to wrap things up, our NDA series, um, you're looking at about three to five minutes per test per sample. Um, what's nice is this instrument allows for the use of solid as well as liquid samples and can be used interchangeably. Um, we have a high capacity auto sampler, so you're able to run multiple analyses at once. You can look at high purity compressed gases, and that is where you're going to use either helium or argon, oxygen, and then that compressed air are going to be what you're going to need to run the instrument. And you can have remote control and service via the cloud service called our VELP Ernie's platform. And now I'm going to hand it off to um, Dr. Ugo Bersolini so he can go over a little bit more about those specific applications and we can go from there. So, My name is uh, Ugo Bersolini. For a long time, uh, I was uh, a user of uh, Duma uh, instrument. Uh, the instrument uh, was uh, in uh, a food company and uh, we have uh, the opportunity to uh, study several uh, raw material and uh, end product. So as uh, responsible of uh, the chemistry lab, uh, we decide uh, to um, to buy an, uh, an instrument for uh, protein determination. Why uh, we choose uh, a Duma analyzer? We choose uh, the instrument because uh, uh, as a, a good speed, a good uh, reliability, low cost, and uh, is a, a compact instrument, instrument. so uh, we don't uh, need a large amount of space in the lab. So with the auto sampler, there is the possibility to um, process uh, um, many samples in, uh, in a queue and uh, there is also the possibility to save the chromatograms and all the condition of analysis. One of the limit of the instrument is the need to have uh, a gas line. Many labs don't have this uh, facility, but um, in uh, one uh, lab, uh, of our company uh, was uh, choose uh, a simple and economical solution. They uh, place uh, uh, two cylinder close uh, to the instrument and uh, in this way uh, this problem was uh, uh, easily uh, overcome. Another uh, aspect is the sample preparation. Because the uh, uh, sample size of the sample is small, between, uh, normally is between 50 and uh, 300 milligrams. And uh, this aspect uh, could be useful when uh, you need uh, to analyze a uh, very small amount of sample, uh, in particular, um, some amount of uh, part uh, of the food, if you want to study the distribution of protein in the product, or uh, a small amount of particles. Um, for this reason, uh, it's better to replicate injection Normally, we uh, do this uh, in triplicate, and uh, normally uh, it's better also to repeat uh, the uh, sequence if the deviation is uh, greater than plus minus 2%. But uh, uh, normally, um, analytical errors 
come because of the homogeneity of the sample. So it's very important to take uh, very attention to this aspect. For solid sample, uh, the coarse grinding uh, followed by a fine grinding uh, could, uh, could be useful. We, uh, here we have an example of uh, a field uh, product uh, grinded in uh, uh, three different uh, conditions. So, freeze, uh, maintain the structure. Uh, without uh, freezing, uh, become uh, like uh, a dot. And uh, if you continue for a, um, a time, uh, 10 seconds in the example, is like a, a dot. You have to choose what is better for your purposes. Semi-liquid sample, um, uh, we, we have to take care, especially when uh, sedimentation, synergies, uh, or solid precipitation can occur. In this case, uh, it's better to sample um, the product after the homogenization. Another problem is when you have a sample with a large amount of water, because uh, two uh, different um, problems can occur. During uh, the evaporation uh, of the water, in the ejection uh, side, the temperature can decrease. So the uh, oxidation can be effect. Then a large amount of uh, uh, gas is developed during the evaporation. The, these two potential uh, negative effects uh, can be eliminated using uh, superabsorbent powder. Uh, that uh, could be, uh, you can uh, add in um, uh, an amount of uh, uh, 50, 100 milligrams, depend on the sample. And uh, uh, this powder absorbs water, facilitating uh, uh, the closure of the foil and uh, delays at the same time the uh, water evaporation, eliminating uh, the problem that I uh, discussed before. Another, another aspect is uh, the oxygen factor. In the software, um, there is a list of uh, uh, standard methods already um, prepared by the factory, but in many cases are too generic. For example, uh, in the list, uh, there is cheese, the category of cheese. In this slide, uh, some example of uh, composition of cheese are reported. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, the composition in protein, carbohydrates, and fat is uh, uh, different, changing uh, the, uh, the cheese. In, uh, the, um, in the table, we increase the uh, calories, starting from uh, the milk, and uh, uh, increasing uh, the amount uh, of uh, uh, lipids and uh, proteins. The higher value of this um, list is uh, uh, milk powder because the amount of water is uh, a few percent. So, 
So uh, using uh, um, SBase method uh, already prepared by the factory, we prepare the method to analyze condiments, tomato base, with uh, um, a high content of water. No problem, all uh, the system work, uh, the result was quite good. But when we change, when we change the kind of uh, condiments using the Genovese pesto uh, that uh, contains uh, a large amount of oil, about 50%, we have the problems because the combustion was not complete. The reason we try to understand why this uh, happened. So uh, we realized that to burn a product with 12% uh, of dry residue is not the same uh, that is burning uh, a product with uh, about 70% of uh, dry residue. In the uh, table uh, is uh, sure uh, the difference between two uh, different uh, recipes. Also, uh, we uh, try to understand uh, the uh, oxygen consumption. Uh, for example, uh, stearic acid uh, during the burning consume uh, 26 molecules of oxygen. Sucrose, only 12. And uh, there is a difference uh, uh, between uh, the energy that is developed. Of course, it is not possible uh, to, uh, uh, to do the same thing uh, uh, in a um, complex product. So um, we try to consider the energy obtained uh, from uh, the nutritional label as a parameter to uh, determine the uh, correct amount of oxygen that uh, you have to add in the combustion chamber. Uh, in uh, this uh, table, I try to uh, correct uh, some values that are reported. Uh, you can see this uh, in the oxygen factor uh, placed uh, uh, in the middle of the table that is written in black against a calculated oxygen factor in the last column uh, written in red. In some cases, just a small correction. In other cases, uh, a little bit higher. For example, uh, pumpkin seeds needs a lot of uh, oxygen because the energy is uh, very high, about uh, more than uh, 600 uh, kilocalories. Um, using uh, the, this um, uh, method, we can correlate the energy against the uh, oxygen needs. So we obtain an experimental linear uh, curve. In this uh, slide, I show you some example. For example, fish that has 153 uh, kilocalories uh, that uh, uh, needs uh, about uh, uh, no, 19 milliliter of oxygen to obtain uh, full combustion 
uh, of a sample uh, without uh, have, uh, without having um, an, a large excess of oxygen because uh, you have to uh, save also the uh, um, the column the reducing column and um, uh, this uh, condition uh, are optimized to burn completely uh, the sample and uh, to have the minimum amount uh, of oxygen in excess in order to save the column. Another thing that I forgot to, 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 to say is uh, um, that you need to use the um, energy obtained uh, by the nutritional label, adding also the fiber contributes because during the burning, uh, also uh, fiber uh, is involved in burning and uh, consume oxygen. So the correct uh, uh, way is uh, to consider kilocalories from the label plus the percentage of uh, fiber multiplied by four to obtain the total. Uh, in the other example, uh, we increase the amount of energy, for, for instance, in a steak and uh, in the last sample, uh, soybean. And uh, at the same time, we need to use uh, more oxygen. The constant uh, 0 0.54 is because you need to burn the tin foil and consider also a bit uh, extra amount to be sure that the combustion is complete. So uh, I finish uh, this uh, presentation. Thanks uh, a lot for uh, your attention. All right, well, thank you very much. Now it is time for some questions. And so if we could give me a minute here to look at our questions. Um, I see one here, which factors should I consider for choosing the right method for my analytical needs? So it's something that I know uh, Dr. Ugo Bersolini touched on a little bit as well, but some of those factors will include things like moisture, protein levels, um, even sometimes fat can be a determination, but what's really beneficial with our system is that with the pre-programmed methods that we already have in our Dumont analyzer, you're actually going to be able to solve most of those issues from the front. So our analytical team has developed a lot of methods that are in accordance with EPA, AOAC, um, AAC, C, depending on the type of analysis. So it's something we can definitely work with you on depending on your analytical needs. Um, we see here another one. Um, are there any difference in results achieved with the two different methods? Now, I'm going to take that as assuming the different methods being um, either Caldol or Duma. So with Caldol, we didn't talk about that a lot in this program, but that is our um, a different way to find protein determination. And really what that's going to depend on is going to be um, the type of sample, what you're wanting to do. Now, the benefit with Duma versus Caldol is going to be that you're going to be able to um, not do batch analysis. And like I mentioned previously, you'll be able to do singular analysis depending on different sample matrices. And you can do those um, in a really shortened time. And that'll be the other big component. So you're looking at three to five minutes for um, a Duma analyzer to analyze, let's say a cheese sample or something very similar. And you'll be looking at upwards of two to three hours for the Caldol method to analyze that same sample. So another question here I have is for the Duma method, 
what is required for sample preparation. And again, I will defer to saying it really does depend on the sample type. Um, but as Ugo was mentioning, as homogenized as you can get that sample is going to be much better. You can use liquid as well as solid, semi-solid samples with our system, but homogenization is going to be really important for that. So I'm trying to see here. Um, I think we've just about ran out of time, but if you guys have any other questions, you can feel free to email um, that email website that we have here. And I'd like to thank you all for your time um, this, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. So thank you very much.